Hello, hello, and welcome to section 2-3. We spent the last few days learning how to create relative frequency distributions and frequencies distributions, and now we're going to create visual graphs to represent the data. So if you have your notes packet for 2-3, this will go right along with those. So we're going to, hopefully, you'll learn how to represent the frequency distributions using histograms, which is a fancy word for bar chart frequency polygons, which is a line graph, and ojibs, ojibs me a home. Anyhow, that's how you say that word. I looked it up. So here we go. Let's get rolling. What's the purpose of graphs anyway? Well, they convey data to the viewer in a pictorial form, and so it helps people visualize it. There are four ways statistical graphs are used, and actually there's more of those. So these that follow, you can pick any four. Number one, they can describe the data, analyze the data, get an audience's attention, because if you see a graph, you can really see a distinction, discuss an issue, reinforce a critical point, summarize data, and discover a trend or pattern. I think this last one is one of the most important ways that it's used is because that they make predictions, for example, for your budget or when you're going to make a profit in a company and things like that. So that's one of the most important ones. Three commonly used graphs in research are the histogram, which is a bar graph, a frequency polygon, and the cumulative frequency graph or OGIV. That's another name for the OGIV is the cumulative frequency graph. OGIV now sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's a lot shorter. What's a histogram? A graph that displays data by using contiguous, that means together, it doesn't, there's no gaps, vertical bars of various heights to represent the frequencies of classes. So right away the heights are the frequencies, so keep that in mind as we go do it. So here's our first example. Construct a histogram to represent the data for record high temperatures for each of the 50 states. This first example is a histogram, and a histogram is just a fancy name for bar chart. So we're going to start out step by step. So when we first start, you start out drawing an X and Y axis, and you don't need the negative portion of it. So there's my X axis, and there's my Y axis. As step one says, you're going to label the X and Y axis. Labels are extremely important. Otherwise, this is just a bunch of numbers, and not very pretty numbers at that. So you have to know what these are representing. So when it it says construct a histogram to represent the data for record high temperatures. So these are our record high temperatures for the 50 states. These are how many states had those record high temperature. So I'm going to go ahead and do my uh, scale here. And to figure out the X scale, which are the class boundaries, I see how many classes I have. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven classes. So I need at least seven marks, and actually I need one more than that, eight marks, so that I can get the upper boundary for the last class. And then on the y-axis, I notice that my high is 18. So we want a nice round scale. So we'll go up to 20, and I'm going to count by twos, because then I'd make 10 marks, and 10 is a nice, neat number. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. But as I said before, let's label what these mean. So on the x-axis, that's talking about temperature. On the y-axis, this one is talking about frequency, or how many states fall into that range. So now we're ready to draw rectangles. Remember that right here, this 2 gives the height of our rectangle, and the, we're counting by 2. So you might want to make sure you label your numbers down here. So there's our labels for our numbers for our x-axis. So these came right from the lower class boundaries. You can see I got them color coordinated. It's all in the coordination, you know. And then on the upper axis, I'm counting by twos. So this one's 10 and this is 20, but this is 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. If you need to, label each mark. All righty, so we know we're going to do a rectangle of height 2, 8, 18, 13, 7, 1, 1. Once you have all your labels and all your numbers, you're ready to rock and roll with the rectangles. So first one has a height of 2. Second one has a height of 8, so I went up to unit 8 and I made this rectangle. You want the rectangles to butt up against each other. That's what it means by contiguous. This is the big jobber, so that's 18. And then you've got 13, 7, 
and then a height of one and a height of one. So there's your histogram. Isn't it beautiful? Very colorful. And we're ready to answer some questions. You can look at this data now and you can see that the class with the greatest number of data values is 109 to 114.5, the blue jobby. It's followed by 13 data values in the class 114 and a half to 119 and a half. So you see how the rectangle falls between that that range of values. So you can easily see ah, most states fell into this range for their record high temperatures. Alrighty. The graph also has one peak. That'll become more important with the data clustering around it. So that's what you can tell from a histogram just looking at the at the graph. Alright. What is a frequency polygon? A graph that displays the data by using lines that connect points plotted for the frequencies at midpoints of the classes. The frequencies are represented by the heights of the points. So here's what it says. You got midpoints and frequencies. Midpoints are going to be your X's. Frequencies are going to be your Y's. All right. Midpoints are going to be your X's. Frequencies are going to be your Y's. You're going to plot points and connect them with lines. So here we have constructive frequency polygon to represent this data shown for record high temperatures. And this was in your book. But here's all the class boundaries. Just to review have finding a midpoint. And I want you to also know the symbolism. Start knowing some of these symbols. X sub M means midpoint. So when you find the midpoint, you have to add these two, 99.5 plus 104.5, and then you divide by 2. So you're going to have 102, 107, 112, 117, 122, 127, and 132 when you do those calculations. Do you notice how these go up by 5 each time? Then um, that kind of shows you they're equally distributed. That makes it easy to put them on the x-axis. Frequencies, these were in your book. And we're going to need these cumulative frequencies later, so we may as well do them on the chart right here in our notes. So you start out with 2. You're going to add 8. That'll give you 10. You add the 10 in the next one, you get 28. 28 and 13 is 41. 41 and 7 is 48. 48 and 1 is 49, and 49 and 1 is 50, because we have 50 states. This is a frequency polygon, so we're on to step 3. Using the midpoints for x values and the frequencies for y values, plot the points. So let's go back. Here's our axis and our temperature and our frequency. The difference is, if you notice, you've, you're using just the midpoints and the frequencies in order to do this frequency polygon. And the midpoints are nicely separated by 5, so they're evenly spaced. So you're going to put those on the x-axis. So 102, 107, 112, 117, 122, 127, 132. Those are going to be your x values, and it's temperature, label's important, and then frequencies. These are our y coordinates. So these are our x coordinates. These are our y coordinates. So we're just going to plot the points. So the point 1022, oh, I forgot. Label your frequencies. So we've got 3 to 18. I just went 3 to 18, and I'm going to count by threes, but you, it's up to you what you'd like to do. So the point 1022 goes there. Then you've got 1078, 112, 18, 117, 13. 122.7, 127.1, and 132 is 1. So then the last step, what you're going to do the last, is just connect the adjacent points with line segments. Draw a line back to the x-axis at the beginning and at the end of the graph, the same distance that the previous and next min midpoints would be located. So we're just going to connect those data points with straight lines. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So they want you also to complete the graph by extending it to the x-axis. So I draw a line down to the x-axis at the end and down to the x-axis at the beginning. Easy. That's all there is to it. All right. Just has some fancy names. What is the cumulative frequency of a class? The sum of the frequencies accumulated up to that class. What is an OGIV? It's a graph that represents those cumulative frequencies and classes. Another name for the OGIV is the cumulative frequency. So here we go. We're on to our next example.
It says construct an OGIF to represent the data shown for record high temperatures. Again, for record high temperatures, we're going to have to find the cumulative frequency for the class, but we've already found that previously in the notes. Here's that chart. And for the OGIV, we're going to be using the class boundaries again as the scale on our x-axis. So step one was find the cumulative frequency. We did that. Now we need to draw the x and y axis and label it. So we've got the uh, labels. And um, the other difference uh, in, the Q in this OGIV is that it says on the y-axis, make it a nice round scale. So if I look at the cumulative frequencies, they go up to 50. So since there's 50, we may as well go up to 50. It's a nice even number. But if it had been like uh, 38, we'd probably go to 40 and count you know, by fives or something like that. So I did, there's 10 marks here, so I'll count by fives on my y-axis. So temperature's there, there's all the temperatures and then 25 and 50 because they go up by fives. All right, we're ready to go ahead and plot those points. The x's are our class boundaries and our cumulative frequencies are our y's. So we're going to start out, when you do this, the one little trick is what we're using for our x-coordinate, you've got two numbers here. Which do you pick? When you start off, it says plot the cumulative frequency at each upper class boundary. So I'm going to start with 104.5 as my x, and this is my y. So we'll go ahead and plot those points. So we'd have 104.5 and 2, 109.5 and 10, 114.5 and 28, and so on. So you have all of these. Now notice the shape of this graph is always going to go up to your total, your grand total of numbers of data that you have. And then what they want you to do for your last step is just connect the dots, la la la. So we're connecting those dots as we go along and you have just created your first OGIV. Yay! All right, what are the cumulative frequency graphs used for? To visually represent how many values are below a certain upper class boundary. So you can see where it curves. Does it curve early on or at the end? What are the four steps involved with creating any stat graph? Draw and label your X and Y. Very, very important. If you don't on the test, I will take points off. Choose a scale for your frequency or cumulative frequencies and label it on the Y axis. Notice the y-axis was always the frequencies or the cumulative frequencies, either the height of the bar or the y-coordinate. Represent the class boundaries for a histogram or OGIV or midpoint of a, for a frequency polygon on the x-axis. So at class boundaries, go on the x-axis for histogram or the OGIV, but for the frequency polygon, you use the midpoint values. Plot the points then draw the bars or lines. Okay, the histogram, frequency polygon, and OGIV are constructed by using frequencies in terms of raw data. What do relative frequency graphs use instead of raw data as frequencies? They use proportions. Well, when is it better to use these than raw data? Well, that's, this is a long explanation. It says, when the proportion of data values that fall into a class is more important than the actual number of data values that fall into that class. What they mean by that is if you're looking for a percentage of population, and let's say we're comparing the percentage of old people or the number of old people in New York City and the number of old people in St. Louis. Well, New York is a much bigger city. If we use bar graphs, it would look really distorted. So, but if we use percentages, it is a more equal comparison because of uh, the, the population difference. So that would be an example of when you would want to use that. Okay, how do you convert a frequency into a proportion or relative frequency? We've already done this, but you just take your frequency and divide it by the total. Relative frequency is the decimal equivalent of a percent. Always needs to be less than one. The sum of relative frequencies will always equal one just like the total of all possible percentages should be 100. And um, that's the end of part one. I think that's enough for one lesson. I will see you tomorrow.